Welcome everyone to Six Degrees Den Haag, The Rise of the Citizen. Before all else, thank you to our hosts, the municipality of The Hague, for inviting us to your remarkable city. My name is Charlie Foran, and I am the, I, the CEO of the Institute for Canadian Citizenship, the organization behind this event. I'm here to act as an MC of sorts for the proceedings today. We are so very pleased to see you all. Over the course of this day, we want, you to involve, we want to involve as many of you as we can in the conversations, exchanges, and engagements about what we and many others believe to be a fundamental question of our time. How do we build together inclusive societies? Building the language and the thinking that will advance inclusion sounds simple, but surely is not. Six Degrees as a project, as a program, emerged from our own conviction that good feelings are simply not enough. We need new language, bold new ideas, and a lot of creativity. It's serious citizen work, and Six Degrees believes it is best done, in effect, together. People of goodwill and smart ideas taking the time to sit and share and to present ideas that are fresh, provocative, unorthodox, even a little uncomfortable, all in the service of arriving at insights which could lead to actions by end of today, by 1700 to be exact. To that extent, we are asking you to participate in an experiment in creating an inclusive event about inclusion. We've done 360s before, but never pushed the concept quite as far as we want to today. We're all a little outside our comfort zones, and in a way that is the idea. So thank you in advance to being open to this. But first let me introduce Deputy Mayor Rabin Baldessing, who we invited to bring his experience and the Dutch experience to the inaugural Six Degrees in September in Toronto. Deputy Mayor. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. A very good morning to you all, dames en heren. Hele goede morgen. Hartelijk welkom. Fijn dat u uh, gehoor heeft gegeven aan de uitnodiging om vandaag met elkaar iets bijzonders te doen. En ik nodig u vooral uit om heel actief te participeren. Active participation, that's what's all about today. And I would like to thank the Right Honorable uh, Adrian Clarkson for being with us today, the 26th Governor General of Canada. It's wonderful to have you here, and John Saul, John Ralston Saul, thank you very much indeed for inspiring us. It's really an honor to know you guys and your staff of the Institute of Canadian Citizenship, because you have been very inspirational for, for us here in the Netherlands, and obviously also here in Europe, because, you know, Europe is heading towards huge challenges. These are troubled times, there are challenges, which lay ahead as far as diversity and inclusion is concerned. Uh, elections are coming up. We have had just an election here in this country. Uh, populism is rising, I believe also in northern part of uh, America. Uh, and I think, you know, how to cope with that, how to cope with populism, but how to cope with, you know, the changing of societies, what to do, you know, to not only stress on the weakness of diversity, but see that diversity is a strength. I think that's a challenge which lay ahead for us here in the Netherlands. Canada is a great example, as far as I'm concerned, where you guys celebrate diversity. Uh, we are not in the position to do that yet, but we want, to we want to learn from you. And indeed, I experienced a lot of inspiration uh, in Canada, in Toronto, uh, at the inaugural uh, of the Six Degrees uh, activity there. And, uh, you know, I thought, let's do it here in The Hague, because we're very much focusing on bringing people together, building bridges. And in that process, we are at this time. And how to cope with that, how to bring, bring people together, and how to build that bridges, that is the challenge which I put forward today to talk about and it would be fantastic if the participation is good, if we can have some tools, you know, to cope with that, because indeed in the Netherlands, but also in the western part of Europe, we are lacking confidence uh, to cope with issues like migration and identity and all that. So let's have a great session. Thank you very much again for being uh, and honoring us 
En dames en heren, heel veel succes. Dank u, Charlie. It's all yours. Dank u, deputy mayor. You may already be getting some idea of why a Canadian civil society organization is in The Hague in early April. But in advance of starting the rise of the citizen property, I'd like to ask our co-founders and co-chairs, the Right Honourable Adrian Clarkson and John Ralston Saul, to explain a little why the Canadian experience of immigration and of inclusion might offer an interesting frame for considering these complex ideas. Adrian and John. Well, good morning. Um, we're, um, you've heard why we're here in part, but we're also uh, here. Uh, it's quite natural that we should start in the Netherlands because of the historic relationship between the two countries, the war, the royal family spending the war in Canada, so many uh, immigrants fr coming from the Netherlands to Canada, and it's just the relationship has continued. So it's very logical that we should start this first experiment with six degrees internationally um, here. And I was asked just to say uh, a few words about what Rabin has already mentioned, which is the Canadian experiment. And the Canadian experiment is not perfect. We've made, I could spend the day telling you about our mistakes and how we have to keep struggling to make it work and so on. But, but what, I, what, what I thought would be interesting was just to say, uh, a lot of people say, oh yes, but you're new and you're big and there's space and you can do whatever you want. And in fact, the Canadian experiment in immigration is about 500 years old. There's a direct line over 500 years. For the first 200 to 250 years, it was the indigenous people who welcomed the newcomers. And a lot of our methodology is not European. That's what makes it a little bit confusing. It's actually a methodology. And I think uh, Nigan will probably talk about this, uh, Sinclair, later. A lot of our methodology is actually indigenous methodology. It's a completely different approach towards belonging and inclusion. Even this room, the idea of doing it in a circle, that's, we, we, we started that because of indigenous ideas. So there was like 250 years of indigenous people really dominating the newcomers, then we betrayed them, and we did some good things, we did some really bad things, and now they're making an enormous comeback to power. But in, 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 from 1848 on, when we started to be a democracy, we're now the oldest continuous democratic federation in the world. It seems strange, but we are. No coup d'etats, uh, no civil wars. Um, from 18, the first law of our first democratic government in 1848 was an immigration law. In 1867, one of the first things of the political confederation of Canada, one of the first acts was to create a ministry of immigration and citizenship, which is independent from the ministry of the interior and from security, right? which is completely different from the European model where all the countries still have immigration under ministers of the interior. And really from the 18th century on, we started developing this model of if you're going to have people come, then they need a lot of help land, cows, horses, machines, wood to build houses. And that goes right up to today when the 40,000 Syrians who've come, I think 60,000 are planned, um, are immediate, half of them are sponsored by citizens. And this is a very interesting model to talk about, the citizen sponsorship model. Because, and this is the last thing I'd say, is one of the things we've developed over the centuries, right from the 500 years on, is that, is that yes, you need government structures. You need a ministry of, the, of citizenship and immigration. You need uh, civil servants. You need uh, regulations. You need a, a whole government thing to make it work, to make the language lessons and the education and get, we take about 300 immigrants a year. It runs between, it's always run between 200 and 400,000 for the last 125 years, that within five years, 95% will be citizens. And once they're citizens, they're new Canadians for about 15 seconds, just before the oath and just after. And as soon as they're citizens, whatever the racism, they're citizens and they have the same obligations, responsibilities and power of anybody else. And um, uh, the, 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 what, but half of what we do has to do with that governmental structure, citizenship ceremonies and all the rest of it. But the other half is citizen uh, volunteerism, citizens working with immigrants. And if you take away the citizen 
uh, involvement supporting the immigrants and the new citizens, if you remove that, the whole governmental thing falls apart. It's not charity. It's not do-gooding. It's not paternalism and maternalism. It is actually that if you people are coming, they're joining your family, and you have an obligation to help them join the family. And that can, you can only bring a kid into education through other parents who have kids in education. You, governments can't make that work. They can set up the laws and regulations, but it's other citizens who help the newcomers become part of the whole. So that's the idea. I could give you a whole other, as I say, long speech on what went wrong and what's still going wrong, but that's the idea of what we've been working on for 500 years. In a way, that's why we started Six Degrees, is to take that experiment into public uh, forums like this. Thank you very much, and have a wonderful day. I don't need that. Oh, you don't need that. Canada is not what everyone thinks it is, which is the perfect little country with the perfect little policies, and everybody is very happy there. And that's why we make immigrants happy, and that's why all, everything works. Canada has a very checkered history. We have very dark episodes in our past. We have been racist. We were very, uh, I'm afraid, we had one of the most uh, difficult situations that we had in the 19th and early 20th century and still have reminders of it is about something called the Orange Order, which has to do with Protestants being violently anti-Catholic. Um, we have had a very bad history uh, for about 100 past years. Before that, it was very good with the native peoples and of uh, trying to uh, integrate them, quotes unquote, into so-called modern life. We are paying the price for that and are now trying very hard to make that right again. There's a lot of things that have to go right. I myself, and everybody's always interested in this, yesterday two ladies outside the Moritz house said to me, how do you get your hair that color? And I said, you have to be born Chinese, and, um, and it has to be in your, both your parents' genes, and then you go gray the way I go gray. Um, and I came to Canada as a refugee on a Red Cross boat with one suitcase for each of our family. There were four of us. And Canada gave me everything. Canada made it possible for me to go to school. Canada made it possible for me to become bilingual, English, French. Canada made it possible for me uh, to have a wonderful television career, uh, which I started in 1965. And Canada made it possible for me to become the Governor General of Canada, the 26th Governor General. When I tell you that the first one was named Viscount Monk and came from Britain, you understand how far Canada came. That is what I represent, and that's what a lot of Canada now represents. And what we are trying to do in our country is not say, we can come here and teach you anything. That's not what we're about. What we're telling you is we, have, we are working on all of this together. And no country is better than any other because the heart of darkness is in every person and every human being, as we all know, even if we don't have any religious beliefs. But what we need is strategies, what we need is commitment, what we need is a manner of talking to each other and of including each other, which makes it possible for us to be part of each other. And to know the other means that we will be able to treat with the other in some way or uh, some way which makes sense, which makes it possible for all of us to fulfill our true humanity and to never forget that, there, that we are all human beings and that no human is more human than any other. That is exactly what we are talking about in a seminar like today. This is what Six Degrees is all about and I hope we're going to come to some interesting observations and I hope some strategies, because when we had our first one, which was a huge success in September, we all got very excited, we all said a lot, and then afterwards we said, well, why didn't we come away with at least five to eight things and tell everybody what we really learned and what, was really, what it was really about? So we're hoping we'll have that by 1,700 hours today. Uh, the Dutch are very efficient in every possible way, and I'm counting on you.
interesting people today. Um, Rabin Baldessing, whom you've already heard from, who is your alderman, and who is a uh, was wonderful in Toronto. We were a very interesting group, and the highlight of one of our days was when Rabin sang to us. Oh! <laughs> and that made a lot of difference to Canadians. We have wonderful mayors. Yes. Oh, housekeep oh, Charlie, housekeeping. I'm sorry, I forgot about well, you. I got all excited by having you did, around and me. would you like to finish the introductions? Or? Why not? Please do. He finish sang, it. and it was wonderful. No other mayors sang, I can honestly say that, <laughs> from any country that, were, what, that was at our meeting. So he is known now in Toronto as the singing mayor of the Hague. <laughs> <laughs> um, Emily uh, Nicola is a, uh, a, a wonderful person who comes um, from uh, Montreal, who is Haitian in origin, as many, many uh, Canadians in Canada are Haitians. And we are, they have added immeasurably to our life, particularly our artistic and literary life. Um, very happy to welcome you. Jennifer Welsh is a, is a Métis uh, of origin and also an extraordinary academic um, who is now running an institute in Florence, Italy. Uh, was educated at Oxford after university in Canada. She had something called the Rhodes Scholarship and went to Oxford and um, has a family and does writing and did the Massey Lectures last year for CBC Radio, which were printed and enormously popular. And Sunny Bergman, many of you know in the audience um, because of her films and the, the kind of personality that she projects into your society, which I think is very interesting. And again, I'm going to leave you till later because I want to introduce you fully when we, we do uh, something special with you. Okay. Thank you, Adrian. And, and the, again, uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. So the final part of a 360 is our desire to have audience, the audience become part of this conversation. It is being designed, as John said, it's in the round. The intention is to begin for these six people to begin like they're having a, a dinner conversation or a conversation over beer. And at some point, however, it is fundamental to the success of the 360 that we get people from the audience to, <coughs> to, to step up, speak their mind, present a, contend a point, emphasize a point, seek perhaps something fresh or different to be brought into the mix. We call these interventions, and myself and Aisha and my, and my me, or, or, or I, are going to be moving around the room. Aisha, identify yourself over there with microphones, <laughs> wanting you to, to stand up, identify yourself very simply, and then to take 60 seconds to speak your mind. The only criteria is that these interventions must move the conversation forward. Sometimes they don't. <laughs> <laughs> As well, I should mention that, as Adrian pointed out, we have assigned seven people to serve as witnesses. They will, their, their commitment, their job for the day is to circulate, to speak with you, to hear what you're thinking, and then at the end of the day to present the, the, those thoughts, those outcomes. That happens much later on today. This is a full day commitment where you're being, courtesy of the, of the Hague, you're being provided food and a lovely setting for this conversation. So thank you in advance for the commitment of that time. And now I would like to ask Adrian to take over 360, shock, inclusion in the shock age. Adrian. Well, I think one of the interesting things is that we all feel slightly shocked now, as, as a, opposed to about a year ago. We do feel shocked. We feel things have happened in the world, uh, particularly, I guess, in the United States, which after all is the Rome of our day, um, that, the, that the empire is very shaken. Um, I was trying to compare it the other day because my eldest daughter gave me a book for Christmas by Marcus Aurelius called Facing Old Age. And um, <laughs> I was reading it and thinking, you know, with the, with the decline of the Roman Empire and the decline of the American Empire, every, you know, history comes in cycles. We don't have to know Spengler to know that. It is very interesting to think uh, that a year ago we would not have imagined we would be where we are now with uh, reading tweets on an endless basis from the person who is supposedly the leader of the free world, um, with the kind of, of rise of, of what used to be not 
permissible public discourse happening in the discourse, people saying things in a way which are hurtful to groups of other people, uh, that they may not have political power, not for the moment, but they do that sort of thing. So we're all in an extremely shaky position. And um, so I'd like to ask right away, Rabin, we know you've had uh, recent elections. We all watched very closely, I think, in the rest of the world, because for us, the Netherlands is a, a very, uh, in Canada certainly, because we've received so many Dutch immigrants, we have so many Canadians of Dutch origin, because Canada helped to liberate um, the Netherlands at the, uh, at the end of the Second World War. We have very close ties. And one of your princesses was born in a hospital room in Ottawa. Um, we have very close ties with, with the country. So we watch what happens. So what would you say now is playing out in the, the Netherlands in the recent months? You know, the problem is that this elections, which we have had, uh, has shown one very predominant thing, and that is that there is a huge, a huge divide in society. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm very troubled about that, Adrian. Um, you, know, uh, you know, the Netherlands is a very, has always been an open society, you know, from the golden ages. You've yeah. been to the Maurits house yesterday and you've seen beautiful things. The Netherlands has been very outspoken towards the world, has been very open. But now what is happening is that we are actually turning our backs towards the world uh, and even towards Europe. And that is also troubling. So populism is rising. I don't think that this election has beaten populism. The prime minister uh, elect had said that already, but I do not agree with that because I see that you know, traditional parties have adopted some ideas with the, you know, the extreme right had. You know? uh, so, so populism is still there. The problem now is, uh, even here in The Hague, you know, if you look at The Hague, the international city in peace and justice, beautiful to be here on the premises of the peace palace, uh, we have been an open society. The majority people has a, a migration background, 51%. So diversity, ladies and gentlemen, my dear Adrian, is there. But does that mean that there is also inclusion? So we're all at a party now, but are we allowed to dance? <laughs> That's not the case. And that is what is troubling me. And that is what this election has shown, that not everybody is included in an open society like we pretend to have in the Netherlands. So there is work to be done. You told us in Toronto, and everybody was really interested in that, um, that you felt now not as secure yeah. and as welcome as you had when you came as a teenager yeah. to the Netherlands. Yeah. You know, you have to understand that I've been living in this country for 41 years now. Um, and, you know, I'm really blessed to be here, uh, uh, mind you. So it's a beautiful country. I enjoy freedom, liberty, you know, the fundamental things of uh, society uh, in this country. Um, and, you know, I've been raised by white people, you might say, mm -hmm. my, my people who helped me to get, uh, you know, my roots, as it were, because I have a larger history here than in Suriname, South America, where I come from, uh, uh, even from India, where my cultural and spiritual invocation comes from. So I am rooted here very much because of the Dutch. And, you know, in the recent years, uh, and I have been, you know, I felt myself very much accepted all the time. But, you know, if I see, you know, the emails I get in recent years, uh, the way, you know, people are, uh, uh, yeah, talking uh, via Twitter, you so anonymously, uh, the way people, um, yeah, tackle you when you're in the city, it has changed. It is not that friendly anymore. And, um, um, and I won't say that, you know, people are uh, uh, harassing me or there are threats. No, that's not the case. Absolutely not. But, you know, the friendliness which I used to experience, that is gone. I mean, that is gone. So it has become a very rude and hard society. And you have to cope with that. And the rudeness has come because of the political debate, because of the fact that, you know, people in parliament, leaders in parliament say, uh, you know, uh, go away. Mayors are telling that. And there is a prime minister, mind you, who has said in recent uh, years, I think it was last year, that he said, you know, uh, get lost. 
So if you cannot cope with, you know, the regulations and all that, get lost. He did not say, I'm going to help you. You know, youngsters troubled here in this society because of identity crisis, you know, generation gap and all that. They need our support and our help. But what we do, what my prime minister is doing, is not going and I say, I'm going to take care of you and I'm going to share, you know, history, values and all that. But I'm... But what you need to do is to get lost. So I think that that is not a good mindset, you know, to bridge and to build up a society. And, you know, that is fundamentally different what you guys have in Canada. Well, the rudeness that's replaced friendliness is only the, the little top of a foam of a wave of what people feel now is permissible. Um, I think in, in societies that, that is something that, that we we always have to watch out for that little bit of foam and and if, if that if that's if that's there and comes towards you you really feel it Jennifer you've done a lot of work on on that kind of thing and, and inclusion and so on how does how do you react to what Rabin has been saying in in terms of uh, of being a historian of yourself having being Métis Métis in Canada means that you have both native and um, and white blood doesn't mean that she is the product of a native and a white person, but it, in the history of Canada, the natives and, and white people intermarried very, very early. And so there's a whole group of people that we call Métis, and, um, and they've added a great deal to our lives together with the, with the uh, with native people like Nigan. How do you react to that, personally and as a historian? Well, when I listen to what you describe going on in the Netherlands, for me, it radiates out to Europe as a whole. Um, I've come to live in Europe over the last 20 years, and you know, Europe this year is meant to be celebrating the anniversary of the Treaty of Rome, you know, the moment that brought it together. Yet what I see living here, and seeing some of what you describe, is a continent that's looking for its soul, uh, that it's actually experiencing you know, profound earthquakes inside its very, its very soul. And I think the, if I can give you the one uh, image or the one uh, tagline that I think demonstrates the crisis facing Europe, it was the report that Médecins Sans Frontières did in 2015. It's a report called Obstacle Course to Europe which basically outlined how Europe was failing in its basic humanitarian responsibilities to people who were trying to come here. And when I see that, I just think the contrast with when the European Union was created is just extraordinary. That we can now be failing not just in whether we welcome people when they arrive and integrate them, but that we actually make it life-threatening Ah, my microphone's going here. We make it life-threatening for them to even get here. And so I think that the, the challenge is really profound. But also in, in responding to what um, Adrian said about the United States, because I'm an eternal optimist, mm -hmm. is it's also potentially a moment for Europe. Because as the United States turns in on itself, I've always been one who said, you know, the values that the United States speaks for are not just U.S. values. But what do you mean by a moment? It is lasting for the last yes. 15 years. <laughs> yeah. I mean, 15 years. Yes, yes. That's, that's quite long. It is, it? it is. A generation is growing up now uh, in a society with, with, with a divide. Mm. So that's, I don't think that's a very, uh, yeah, good Yes, thing. we should stop, you're absolutely right, we should stop talking about it as a crisis which suggests it's temporary or it's yeah. just emerged. I absolutely agree with you. Uh, and I think anyone who studies populism and, the, and what you described, the rise of populism, will tell you that these divisions have been accumulating for a long time. Uh, and we can discuss the causes. You know, political scientists love to do this endlessly. Is it economic inequality? Is it relative deprivation? You know, we can talk about all of these things, but you're right, it has been building uh, for a very, very long time. And so it's not as though it's suddenly uh, appeared. But I do think there is a, a potential here for Europe to think about what really distinguishes it. Will it live up to those humanitarian uh, values again? 
and uh, that we should view not as necessarily a challenge we can't meet. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think as the, the organizers of today have also um, demonstrated or in their work is that it isn't just about what governments do. So yes, we were all focused on the Dutch elections. We hoped it was going to be the bulwark. You know, it was, it was the moment where things were going to turn and populism would not continue to unfold. But as you say, the divisions are still there. It's what happens below it's the level of government. That, so, sorry, yes. sir. It's interesting, though, that internationally, the press covered our elections as if populism was beaten, which was not, was not the case. Which, <laughs> which was not, yeah, which no. was not the case. And so people really wanted to believe that story, I yeah. believe. Mm -hmm. yes. And no, it wasn't right. true. Right. No, it wasn't true. As the mayor said, uh, a, a, a there's more than half of parliament uh, filled with parties that have in more or less adopted populist strategies. Yeah. And I mean, our PVV has won. So he wasn't beaten. He was just not the biggest, <laughs> which yeah. it's that, you know, so that don't go by the percentage, right? Because yeah. yesterday I noticed that, you know, uh, people was talking about, you know, this PVV, huh? <laughs> Mr. Wilders has only got 13%. <laughs> it is 13% right now. But mind you that, you know, at in the last moment, people changed uh, their thought, you know, and did not go for the PVV, but did they go for the conservative liberals, yeah. so for the prime minister party, because the prime minister uh, said in the last, uh, the last phase of uh, this election process that he will never, never, never govern with Mr. Wilders. So uh, that meant, you know, that people thought, hey, if I go for this guy Wilders, we will not be in power, so they changed their mind. So I think that around 20% of our society, uh, you know, adopts and embraces populism. 20%, perhaps even a little bit more. I would say bigger. Adrian, <laughs> my dear friends, that. that is a huge percentage, <laughs> yes. isn't it? Yeah. Yes. yes, it is yes. a huge percentage. But I think it's the, huge. the other message that we took, correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. from the outside, from your election was, hey, it's really important to show up. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, look what happened in the United States, how many people did not show up. Because you're right, it's divided, but it means the one niggling worry I have about us saying, you know, yes, there's what government does, but what we have to do as citizens, we must remember, and this I do think generations, new generations are forgetting, the politics, high politics part still matters. Mm -hmm. Do your work as citizens, but show up at the polls. And that's the message many of us took from the Dutch election. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we are in the Peace Palace. It's an absolutely wonderful location here. And the EU was created um, uh, to counter nationalism that led to wars. It, that peace is threatened now, you feel? Is that peace threatened? Ooh. Is peace threatened? Uh, I don't think that peace is thre uh, threatened, uh, uh, but, you know, uh, uh, the, 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 the foundation of peace is a little bit shaking uh, because of the fact, you know, that if I look at the election which has happened here in this country, you know, the, in my analysis, it was about three things. The first one was identity, uh, so people felt threatened, yeah, identity. The second one was social security, uh, and the third one was fear. You know, politicians, uh, 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 our leaders, uh, succeeded in bringing up fear into the society. And because of that, I think that there is something going on as far as uh, peace is concerned. So it's not threatening, but, you know, there, it, I'm troubled. I'm worried, actually. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, at this point, I would like to introduce Negan Sinclair. Uh, Negan Sinclair is a Anishinaabe, uh, uh, what uh, Europeans call an Indian, and, um, and sometimes they call themselves Indians among themselves, and we call them First Nations because they are the First Nations of Canada. And I think your point of view brought in right here is, would be interesting, so okay. let's hear it. Well, miigwech. Bonjour, Ndinu e Maganaduk. Bonjour, Nwichawaganak. Nigan wewudam Indigenous Kaas. Namagoshin do dem. Nimen wenda momai ayen. 
Ganabach, Agujing, Gisena. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to uh, to introduce some of my language to this territory and to recognize the people whose territory this is on. And uh, I want to say miigwech for inviting me. And uh, we have come a long way since September, the last time we sat together in a circle and we discussed. And uh, of course, I heard uh, your beautiful song. And um, I want to talk about singing for just a moment as a responsibility of leadership. And it's not a coincidence, I don't think, as we had many Indigenous people in the audience, that that was when you were recognized as a leader. Because for us, it is when you share the gifts and the gift of unity that that is the responsibility of a leader. Uh, here is the, the biggest challenge I think that Europe is facing. And as an Indigenous person in North America, this is not my home. I have some relatives here, but I have uh, very little relationship to this territory other than to say that my relatives, my uncles and my grandfather uh, fought for this territory on behalf of their relatedness with your relatives. Because they felt a relatedness to the relatives that we adopted, and coming into North America, we then agreed to be part of a world network in which to come and fight for the liberation of this territory as well. Now, I'm a university professor, so I wouldn't be a university uh, professor without having a PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> a very sacred, a traditional PowerPoint. <laughs> but I, I just want to show you a few things because I feel as though it's almost impossible to talk about indigeneity and indigenous people without referring to the original, if you want to see the original uh, model for EU or the original model for Europe, we had Europe, the EU, for tens of thousands of years, a millennia. We had that in North America. Um, and we continue to still have that today tens of thousands of nations together in a unified network of trade and relationship and family. Not perfect. We had wars, we had famine, we had struggles, but we had an international network in North America on, embodied by the system on the left. How did we do that? How did we do that for tens of thousands of years? Uh, that's my territory. Those are my people, the Anishinaabe, the, also known as the Ojibwe or the Chippewa, the Anishinaabe peoples, and that's our territory to the right. Now, what you'll notice is that in 1783, uh, a whole bunch of different se 17 whatevers, 1783, the Treaty of Paris decided to divide us up in uh, what's now known as Canada and the United States. But we still have a nation. Our nations is made up of many nations. And so you might be wondering, how does that work? How does that operate? Uh, can we flip to the next one there? <laughs> how does that operate? How that operates is we have had a universal, long-standing, legally recognized system of adoption in which we have adopted peoples as we ourselves were once adopted by our non-human relatives, by the, hum by the water, by the sun, by the stars, by the earth, by the animals, as we were once recognized and adopted within our creation stories and our legal, legal frameworks, we then adopted Europeans. So the real discourse that I always want to struggle up against and sort of problematize is that Europeans coming to North America was nothing new. It was like just, it was just another thing. It was just another event. And so when Europeans came in, we adopted them. They didn't adopt us. It's not the way in which the story often goes is that Europeans came in and took over. We adopted them and taught them our ways, which then became the foundation for Canada and the United States. Every law, every policy, every piece of language, every name has an indigenous foundation within it. And so as you can see up on the top left, those are our relatives who fought in World War I. These are our young people who, fought, who, who struggle today among suicide and poverty. The struggle is still the same. It is to continue who we are with our adopted relatives that we bring throughout the world, as we now even adopt uh, new prime ministers, as you can see in the bottom. Uh, this concept is the next one. This concept is simply to say that our principle of adoption was always that we would take newcomers and we would adopt them into networks. And we would meet them. And then we would offer them a gift, like a song. And when that gift was accepted, because you didn't have to accept the gift, 
But when that gift was accepted, you became family. And when family, we all know, is different than friends. Because friends are something that is temporary and is always based in a place and time and context. Family is for life. No matter how much you disagree, no matter how much you dislike, no matter how many weapons you, often, you can bring, such as words or even a gun, when you bring those things to your family, your family still continues, even in the devastation of what violence produces. That's what we did, whether it was the name that we offered to Europeans who then adopted names like Kanata, which means the village. It doesn't mean pipeline. <laughs> it means the village. It means our riches are in our relationships to each other. And when we offered that, and when it was accepted for us, that is law. That then, therefore, we are family, meaning we don't leave our family out in the cold. We don't take our family and we lock them in a closet forever called a reserve. It's we don't take our family and then beat them into submission with poverty and keep them under control, under policy and law. We actually bring them to the table. We invite them to the table and say, bring your gifts, bring your songs. And when you bring that, that is your responsibility. The biggest difference between Western civilization and indigenous civilization is that Western civilization has put at the primacy, and I think, believe populism is the epitome and the core of this, is a rights-based monologue, meaning that it is my right to be here, it is my power and it is my privilege to be here. And somehow that has become completely bastardized into a, an ignoring that it is the responsibility that we have to each other. And that is what indigenous peoples have tried time and time again to teach peoples all throughout the world upon co coming to our territory, is this, uh, the last slide, is that it is our responsibility to one another that creates more life. And that it is, you have nothing, it, in indigenous worlds, it, it, rights mean nothing. It means <laughs> you come to the table and say, I have a right to be here. We'd be like, yeah, enjoy that. <laughs> because it is your responsibility. What did you bring to the table today? Where's your food? Where's your, where's your name? Where's, your, where's the family that you brought? Where's the riches that you have brought, the things that you have gifted? Because I too have a responsibility to gift to you. It's like a huge potluck. Do you guys have those here? That is, that is an indigenous governance. That's a law, which is the best held in a circle, which is why this circle is, uh, I felt very home when I walked in today because uh, very, it's very Anishinaabe to be in this framework. This is our legal framework of everybody brings something to the table and that's why I believe so strongly in the six degrees model. I believe in it because each one of you is bringing something to the table like a potluck and that beautiful gift that you are offering like a song, like your words, like your handshake is about responsibility. It's not about exploitation. It's not about rights. It's about you bringing something important to the table and making life because life at the best of times is created when there is more life. And that is what the principle of nationhood of what many nations looked like in North America for millennia. And that is what I think Europe is now forgetting is that it's all about the individual rights that each nation is, is speaking to each other instead of the collective responsibility. With that, I want to say miigwech, miigwech for letting me uh, be very professorial for a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> miigwech. I think we all enjoyed it. And, it. and it's a very necessary part of what we are as Canadians, so that's, you're showing the best part of what we are Canadians. I'm very proud of the fact that I was adopted by the Blood Tribe when I was Governor General and, and that, um, that I have a wonderful headdress which I've yet had occasion to use, um, but that I am, uh, and I was named in a naming ceremony, all of that is wonderful too. Because and those are responsibilities. Those are responsibilities because now. And do you know what my name is? Grandmother of many nations. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Which, they gave me that name and it's sponta done spontaneously around the thinking and as they dance and as they, they plan it, et, et cetera. And I was very nervous about what they would call me because I thought it's going to mean a great responsibility for me to be, do whatever it is that name calls and I was worrying that it might be something like Little Yellow Bird or <laughs> uh, and it wasn't. It Sometimes wasn't. That, that happens too. But yes. a, name, a name is really gifted so that you, you, you enter into it. So my name means uh, Nigon Wewadum. It means the future sound or the sound of the future uh -huh. and, or the, the leading sound. 
But, um, uh, you know, C Canada, uh, we haven't really talked about that too much. I don't want to spend too much time talking about the Canada's issues and problems, but really Canada's problem um, has, always, has not been about the way in which Indigenous peoples have struggled to, to civilize or to adjust to society. It has been Canada's now 150 years of genocidal pol policy, which has forcibly both locked people onto reserves and choked them into poverty. And that's under a, a policy and a law that we have in Canada called the Indian Act. And I won't get into it too much, but it, it's, a, it's a very draconian, controlling, genocidal policy. And so um, that's, that's, that is the rights-based monologue. We have the right to the land. We have a right to remove people from the land, and we have a right to take everything that you are and crush it into whatever we wish it to be, which is but, Christianity. But, but Nigan, you know, you said something very interesting in your introduction. Uh, you said that, you know, you guys uh, <clears throat> had the capability to adopt the Europeans coming in. So you did adopt them. They yes. did not. Mm -hmm. What's the reason for that? Is that only, you know, the fact that they thought it's my right to be here, or is, that, is there something else beneath it? Well, I think uh, <coughs> terra nullius is the concept of the land is empty. Manifest destiny is that God ordains it for Europeans to come and take. Um, those are both policies that within, within law or beliefs that found their way into uh, law that both the United States and Canada. Um, you know, the first moment of uh, the interaction between a European and an Indigenous person in, in Canada is when Cartier, Jacques Cartier, comes and plants the stake and says, this is New France, this is my land. And uh, Indigenous people, a chief named Donna Canna, comes up and says, May, uh, take that down, take that stake down, because you don't walk into somebody's house and start rearranging the furniture. You ask first, or you offer a gift first, and that is the great... Uh, we've never recovered from that moment. I think we're still struggling with that moment yeah. today of uh, people who come to Canada who are indoctrinated into a sense of it's my right to be here and Indigenous peoples time and time again we march in the streets, we enter policy, many of us are going into government to struggle to say no it's actually the responsibilities that we share to one another that will make our, our, our society not our rights to one another. Yeah. I was trying to get an answer, you know, if you look at societies now, here in Europe, in the Netherlands, you know, what most of, you know, people saying to us, to newcomers, to migrate migrants, you've come in, so you have to adopt. Mm -hmm. That is what they're tell. why is that? I mean, why are, you know, people who used to stay here, who are, let's say, indigenous, not capable in adopting what is coming in. And that's, I think, a key question I have. Is it because of the fact that these mines are colonial mines, imperialist mines? I mean, what's going on? Why are people, Europeans, not capable in saying to others, you've come in, thank you very much, uh, you have an asset, and I'm going to use your asset to bring society forward. Well, that, that, Emily, that's Emily has it. That's, that's often the, the irony of it in, in Canada and the United States, people of European descent being, you know, you, you come here, you need to, to adapt, yeah. and indigenous peoples going like, yeah, that would have been a great idea, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but there's also, you know, there's also something we can learn listening to Nigan about how indigenous peoples also approach the arrival of new people now to Canada. So I remember a conversation I had when I was able to travel across Canada to give the Massey lectures just outside of Saskatoon um, at, a, at a very sacred piece of land with a young um, Aboriginal activist. And I asked him, I said, you know, what would you do if a Syrian refugee came here at the moment? You know, what would you, what would you say? What would you want that person to know? And listening to you, it, it, it reminds me of his, his response. He said, well, first of all, I would think about it as them entering into a relationship. You know, they've arrived, they're entering into a relationship. Uh, and he said, I would ask him or her why they're here, why they've come, and with that begin the process of healing about the cause from which they've come. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was just an, a very refreshing approach to how you would think about a an initial conversation. Uh, and you might have thought, you know, the attitude, uh, picking up on your comment, would be different. But I came away from that conversation thinking, yes, because a Euro Europeans or settlers are thinking of this very much as you put your finger on it. What asset are you bringing? Mm 
Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. otherwise, you don't have a right to yeah. be here. And unless I, you have an asset, unless you have yeah, you know, yeah. a certain Sunny, income, right? Sonny, you did a film it's called me. Our Colonial uh, Hangover. Yes. Is, uh, relevant to this discussion of our the larger discussion of colonization? Yes. yes, definitely, because in reaction to what Rabin said, that for example, Holland has always been an open country, I wouldn't really agree on that because I think what we've been is imperialist and this this mindset of uh, the world is ours for our taking, um, which calls uh, which has shaped how we look at the world. Um, and it's something that the uh, professor Gloria Wecker calls white innocence, that we, want to, we don't want to see mm. how we've colonized and how we've exploited the rest of the world. And so we need to decolonize that way of thinking first before we can actually call ourselves an open cu culture, I think. Um, so, so this whiteness for, like I made our colonial hangover and that, that was specifically on the issue of black facing and the debate that um, spun out of that, but it showed um, what's happening in the Netherlands. It shows that there's a generation who's born here, who's second or third generation with immigrant roots, who says, this is my country and I want to decide how we, also I want to put, you know, talk, have a seat at the table and yeah. talk about how we um, do away with these racist traditions. And that really caused uh, a backlash. Like there's so many people who got very, very angry about that because they were still uh, harboring the idea that those people are guests in our country. They should know their place, so they shouldn't be too outspoken. And that's, that's, I, that's I think, what the kind of um, uh, struggle that we see now, that, for true, that, that, that there isn't really this idea of true citizenship on an equal basis yet. And whiteness is, is, is the... the, the as, as it were, the ticket for true citizens. Yeah. Whiteness is. Yes. Your whiteness yes. is. Yeah. Emily, you know, as a Haitian living in Montreal, and there's, uh, for people here, we have a, a very large Haitian population in Montreal, which is, uh, which is hu hugely contributing to uh, our uh, every kind of uh, aspect of, of economic, cultural well-being. Um, and my successor as governor general was a Haitian immigrant. Um, and I want to ask Emily how she, well, there's a couple of things. First of all, have you noticed more rudeness lately in any way in, 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 in uh, Canada in, and in Quebec, particularly where you live? Uh, do, you, do you feel that your organization, which is Quebec Inclusive, uh, addresses that question of whiteness and uh, people of color? Yeah, the question of, of uh, whiteness is always interesting to think about in Quebec because um, in a way, um, French Canadians are a minority within the European makeup of Canada and only 1% of people in North America are native French speakers. And so when you think about whiteness, you think about position of dominance. Um, but you, we, in Quebec, you have a majority of white people who think of themselves as not in the dominant position within the larger context, and so it adds a layer of complexity. And so, and my job as uh, as a citizen, as an activist, as a as an anthropologist, is to try to grapple with this this layer of, of complexity. Um, but um, I would say that yes, uh, Quebec society has become very always has been, um, but um, is very much influenced by the debates that have been going on in France. Um, and so, um, and in Quebec City, uh, specifically where I grew up, um, you have a, a media environment that has stirred the divides a, a little bit like you were, you were talking about. And so in a, in a way, um, we had, um, uh, you may have heard of the, the attacks that we had in Quebec City at the end of January, where, where um, several people were killed uh, inside a mosque. Um, by, by a shooter who was animated by racist, um, by, by racist um, motives. Um, in, in a way, this is very much the result of entitlement to hatred that comes from uh, media doing, being irresponsible. Um, but this calls for, as you were speaking to, um, you know, un undoing the myth of white innocence that you often have in Canadians who don't know their history and do, who do not know that they are on indigenous land, often in Quebec, unceded. Um, 
indigenous territory, and um, and this this inability for people to understand their uh, their their history of colonialism, as you were saying, makes that for for citizens that they are ill-equipped to understand the divides that exist. And so I'm much more interested personally in blaming who's doing the, the, the miseducation rather than the people who are miseducated. Mm -hmm. uh, very, just add a little footnote here about ceded land because it's very important and it's important to mm -hmm. what Nigan said. Thank you, I was just wondering what What ceded mean. land yeah. means. Well, basically, um, the, uh, the colonial powers, the British, um, when they had gained all control of Canada after, after the French defeat in the late 18th century, um, proceeded uh, uh, apace through the 19th century to do treaties with native peoples. And they started on the East Coast with Treaty 1, and they moved across the country. I think it got to about Treaty 9, if I'm not mistaken. I don't think 11. 11, yeah. But they never got to BC. So, so the reason why is because the Royal Proclamation, the king basically declared in 1763, everything's mine. <laughs> and he said, up until the Rocky Mountains. And then that's why today the treaties only go up to the Rocky Mountains, and then British Columbia is a new treaty process because the king never declared those lands as mine. <laughs> and so First Nations in BC are somewhat lucky, but they're also hard, not so lucky because negotiating a treaty today for land is, is very yes. difficult for a, a Canadian power which is hell-bent on economic extraction. Mm -hmm. Well, the, um, the rest of the treaties, uh, and they started early and then they went through Ontario. And as Governor General, since I represented the Crown, I often reenacted those treaties when they, when they came up just to, and, and it was always very, very, sad in many ways because I would say the words that the crown said to the native peoples such as we are treating with you nation to nation yeah. uh, so, so the treaties uh, really for the crown was was for one purpose was getting the land as quickly as possible yeah. but for indigenous nations treaties were about making family yeah so that's why there's two different ways of seeing treaty there's the crown's way which is take 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 lock you into our, onto reserve which was the royal proclamation and then the second is the treaty was, let's make family, let's everybody make responsibility and everybody bring something to the table and let's make something together. Mm -hmm. And it always ended with, uh, and these, this treaty shall be as, as good at, and as long as the sun shines, the grass grows and the river flows. Mm -hmm. And, and of course it. we betrayed all of that, basically, you know, the, the people who were not indigenous. So we've been they, trying to write it. And, and now, uh, that's just as, as a background so you understand what, how we look at the country and the nation now, and, um, and that now when we negotiate treaties, as they're doing in BC, it takes decades to do. The Nishka people negotiated for 40 years for their treaty. It took two of their chiefs' lives to negotiate those treaties, and I was very happy to give royal assent to the treaty for the Nishka peoples and their lands when I was Governor General in 2001. But that's, that's, that's how history intervenes with us and how we must keep going with the history. It is, it is not over now. Um, Adrian, yes. uh, we're about the halfway mark, and I'm yep. wondering if we might get an intervention. Are you, would you be? Yes, absolutely. Excellent. Maybe Please stay. Dying to say something. something. We'll give you 60 seconds. Yes, hi. Um, thank you, first of all, for organizing this. It's very necessary. Um, I am Hannah Nambulotvi. I'm a political scientist, so 60 seconds is going to be a tough one. But I'd like to add some, um, <coughs> some historical context to the Dutch situation. Um, because I, whiteness obviously has, like, is an issue, especially now, the multicultural society and all the discussions about populism. But what we seem to forget in the Netherlands is that the Netherlands was al already very segregated in it by itself uh, up till uh, the 60s with the polarization structure. So you had four pillars, uh, the, the Christian, the, the Protestants, the uh, Catholics, the socialists and the liberals that li lived separately from each other. And that's something very interesting because it's not just um, black and white or you know, immigrant, non-immigrant issue. It's basically, um, when I think about it and I've thought about it very long and very hard because obviously I'm, I'm also from an uh, immigrant background, is it's also about 
security and insecurity. Right now, we're at the moment of a very, very, you know, everything is insecure. The economic system is a, is, is a big mess. They, you know, the, the war zone has their consequences. We don't take the responsibility for our actions when we, you know, the interventions that have been going on. Everyone is just acting as if these um, refugees just pop up out of nowhere. And then um, it made me realize it's not just, you know, who we are as, you know, citizens in, within the framework of states. It's who we are as people when we face insecurities. You, when people face insecurities, they tend to be, you know, more protective and tend to, you know, try to claim their own space. And that also, you know, results into trying to push the other away. How do you feel about that? Yeah. Do, I'm just going to ask Emily, do you feel that, the, that people in the Haitian community have, have felt that kind of fear and felt pushed back? although they were initially very well accepted by Quebec because they spoke French so wonderfully. And that was, that was a great help to the French speakers of, of Canada. Yes, there, there, there has been important change over the decade, um, and partly because the Haitians first started arriving in Montreal uh, in the 60s, uh, where it became possible for people of, largely people of non-European descent to even become citizens in Canada. It started out mostly in the 60s and the 70s, so it's a very recent thing. We need to uh, remind ourselves our, of, of that. Um, but there was in Quebec uh, this process that we've been calling the Quiet Revolution, which is uh, the Quebec provincial government uh, taking over um, building its, its, its state and calling on immigrants from other Francophone countries to be state builders. So Haitians have been an independent country since 200 years and many of them came and helped build the, the foundational institutions of, of modern Quebec. Um, more, more and more though, there's been a framing of, of black population in Quebec that is very similar to the, the conflicts that you, you would imagine in, in the United States um, as well, but just one, one thing that strikes me in your comment is this idea that um, societies can change very fast. And um, it is about um, not thinking that the way things are are, are, are are the way that things will always be. I, I'd be curious to see you know, what kind of quiet revolutions could happen here in the Netherlands in terms of thinking differently about um, about, uh, about diversity, but also about, as you were saying, the internal diversity of people who think of themselves as native, and then how that framework influences how we include then also others and expand the, cir the circle. Yeah. But you know, fear is also often manipulated. I mean, this, the, sorry, the sorry fact about the politics of fear today is that it's resorted to because it apparently works unfortunately. But you know, think about how fear has been manipulated in the, in the past as well. You know, we were, you were talking about whether we could see violence. Again, think about the Balkans not so long ago and how fear, you know, peoples who had lived side by side in Sarajevo, how fear was, was manipulated uh, by politicians. And I think it's important to remember that because in relative terms, when we talk about security and threats, they're fabricated. They are, they're made, they're created by a, a particular way of looking at the world. They don't just exist as an objective fact. I mean, think about this. The United States from the early 1980s to today has taken, what, roughly about three million refugees? Not a single one has committed a terrorist act. There's the, an empirical fact yet. What's the discourse in the United States today? It's all about the securitization mm -hmm. of refugees. So I absolutely agree with, with <coughs> your comment about security, but I also think in, you know, in, in relative terms, we are very secure compared to uh, generations of Europeans who lived through war, but security and fear is manipulated politically, and we what? must remember that. One thing I would add uh, to, your, to your comment is this, the idea of fear is the idea of fear of change. Um, change from tradition that were invented. So in a way, to the, the, the fear of losing um, a timeless past that never existed is often a key in these debates. And one of the things um, that Nigon said about, about Canada is that we need to remember how we used to 
function and how indigenous people have adapted this and how, you know, there, there's ways, there's things in our history that we need to remember to look at the better way forward. Um, but often when we, people who want uh, inclusion and who, who embrace diversity often are framed as anti nationalist or anti anti tradition but i think perhaps you know one of the ways that i find in my work in quebec to frame it is to actually just remember that the diversity was always there and that the first black person arrived in canada with a champlain with the founder of quebec city 400 years ago that this is not a recent story and so um, it, we, we, we have been part of this fabric since the beginning, and there are, th there are things in our history that we have been erasing to construct this myth of homogeneity, homogeneity that then serves to picture everybody that comes from different background and French background as, as threats to, to the original makeup of Quebec that never actually existed. And I think it's, 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 it's crucial to understand that the way that we tell our history is actually always political, and the narratives that we choose to uh, put forward have a huge influence into, uh, in how we, how, we see them, how we see ourselves and who uh, we see as welcome. Can I just react to the, the, mon the fear mongering and what we've seen in the election now, there's been so much in emphasis exactly on that, like that our traditions are being taken away. There was a whole thing about Christmas disappearing and, and there had been a rumor that one school wouldn't put up a Christmas tree because Muslim pupils wouldn't agree with that, which was complete BS, but it, it hadn't happened, but politicians really drove on that theme and, and, and so this fear mongering is, 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 is interesting to think about how we can counter that or... or and, and nostalgia. Mm -hmm. Nostalgia. Yeah, the kind Make of America great again. Yeah. Can I say one thing about fear? I mean, we have many traditional stories about fear. And, uh, and it involves our fear of usually the, a, a nation nearby coming to take or kill or whatever. And so we have many, many stories like that. But they're always equated with two things. One is ice and cannibalism. Not that we were cannibals, because we were not cannibals. Um, we were not cold, uh, dark uh, savages, as you read in the dime store garbage novels and movies <laughs> like uh, created by Hollywood. But we were, we were people who were innately aware of nation building. And we were people who understood that law, that when law was made based on fear, it always led to ice or death, uh, isolation, or it led to you literally eating yourself or con consuming yourself with the embodiment of that fear that you destroy yourself. And when our leaders follow those two directions, they led us to isolation and death. And so that's why we always tried our best to turn away from those things. Um, and we might call them xenophobia and we might call them violence or extraction or theft. We might call it those things, but now, but we always understood those things very innately. Yeah. Adrian, Adrian, the room, yes. the room has come alive. Yes. With people wanting to. With the be, sound be, of music. Yes, yes. 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 that too. Over here, that yeah. too. <laughs> First of all, thank you for your contributions. Um, I, I would like to ask a question concerning the Dutch situation. We've been talking about that the 20% of people that support populist parties, and my question concerns what strategies we could use to include that uh, political base into the conversation. So how can we start to uh, listen to each other and also listen to that uh, part of society that votes PVV or any other populist party? Uh, so, so how does that, how do we, what strategies do we, can we, um, can we use to, to uh, include them also into the conversation? Yeah. yeah. It's a good question. It's a good question, but I must disappoint you because I do not have the answer for that. Uh, I'm really sorry, but I hope to learn, I mean, today, uh, because we have to find an answer. You know, there is another aspect which is very important. We were talking about fear. Um, uh, another notion which has come up with fear, I think, is the aspect of anger. So there is lots of anger. Yeah? That's something different, right? Anger and fear. 
So there is lots of anger uh, in society here in the Netherlands, but you have two kinds of anger. So you have the anger which we are confronted from uh, this white people, let, let me put it like that, uh, Christmas and all, you know, uh, Black Pete was also a discussion, and of course the whole uh, migration, uh, 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 migrants coming in, etc. So there is a kind of anger because they don't feel consulted, etc. But there is another kind of anger, and that is the anger with the migra mi migrants itself. And that has led to the fact that for the first time in Dutch history, there is a migrant party with three seats now in parliament. Uh, and that is because of anger. The anger is that, you know, you are, uh, uh, you know, saying all kinds of things about, you know, those who came in, did their hard work, and that those were my father and my grandfather coming in, in the Netherlands, worked as guest laborers, as we call it, we call them. And there is no respect towards that aspect anymore. And they're angry, they're angry, and that is the reaction we're getting in. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, we have indeed to find an answer to that, you know, how to, to bring that a little bit, but I, I really do not have the answer. I don't, I, I don't know Can whether... I just react personally, because I, I, uh, I've done interviews a lot with people who might vote PVV. And um, I think when you look at it from an interpersonal dialogue, um, what you have to do is really listen. So when I interview those people, I, I go along with it. And mostly, um, of course, there's other worries that underlie uh, their yes. xenophobia. So I don't see, like you were saying, I don't see them as the perpetrators. I see the cl classical scapegoat uh, uh, theory in place because they're worried about their income, they're worried about the housing for their kids, so they're not going to find their work. Yeah. Mostly... But that wasn't an issue, huh, the election anymore. What, the... Work and income and health care no, and why, all that. That's why I don't Important agree. things. That's why I don't agree that populism is only 20%. I think it's 50% because even oui. the, pay, the PVD and the CDA and, yeah. and, and some respects even like the PVD was, was playing along with this trend because they were all like wanting to get Henk and Ingrid on board. Henk and Ingrid is like our proverbial name for the, the PVV stammer or the normal yeah. Dutch person who's worried. I think, <laughs> I, I think, a lot, I think that, um, is my mic working? Yes. 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 I, think, I think that a lot of uh, people who worked or inclusion in my personal opinion do wrong yes um, is that we separate the conversation from social and economic inequalities mm -hmm. from the conversation about immigration and inclusion yeah. and cultural diversity um, and there is often a strong disconnect between quote unquote the, the old left and the people who work towards inclusion. And so we, when we do that, and when we do not foster the, this conversation, we let immigrants being used as scapegoats for issues that have nothing to do with them in terms of inco economic uh, insecurities. Uh, but we also disconnect people who should be allies in sense that we are all put at a disadvantage by a, a similar system and we should work together, um, but often we don't know each other and we have, we work within a political system that associate immigration and diversity with elites most, most often than not. Yeah. Um, and so, and this, this way of framing the conversation I think is very toxic and unhelpful. And so we need to look at ways that we can frame, you know, people who are worried about job and labor, but also people who are, you know, immigrants who are also worried about job and labor, you know, not as, because as enemies, that's, that's yeah. a divide and conquer, that's yeah. a divide yeah. and conquer um, strategy and it's been doing. Um, Racism is a political tool. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And it's been doing damage in, in, in Canada uh, as well as everywhere else. Uh, Adrian, this gentleman would love to yeah. step in. Uh, very good morning to everybody. Mm -hmm. My name is Khalid Ahmed Choudhury from International Human Rights Commission. First of all, my compliments uh, to the sixth degree, Canadian Institute for Citizenship, uh, Governor General, Honorable, Deputy Mayor of uh, The Hague, uh, Mr. Robin uh, Baldev Singh, Ambassador of Canada, and all of you. We are sitting here. It's a historical day for the legal capital of the world, The Hague. 
Actually, what we are talking about, we, he uh, we heard you, sir. And that's the problem. Because until, unless we support that we belong to each other, we are family. So we cannot solve and resolve this issue. Couple of years back, the European Council declared Netherlands third largest racist country uh, at this continent. And there was no debate, no discussion, nobody came out. And I have been talking to each and every prime minister of this country. I have been talking to the members of the cabinet, the, uh, the members of the uh, parliament, and asking them that this gulf which, has, which is increasing between the different segments of our society, it is going to, uh, to burst in, into this. But unfortunately, they have been using a, a policy of ostrich. Each and every person have been telling me, don't worry, nothing will happen in this country. And this is the situation, this is the scenario that the political party and the leadership of Netherlands, most of them, they have been failed. It is their responsibility. They have been voted and supported by the majority of the citizens of Netherlands to bring people together, to say that we, are, we belong to, uh, uh, together. And we have the majority, main, main party leaders who have been denying that we are not a multicultural society. So the, the major issue is we'll, we'll have to think global, we'll have to act global, so then we can solve and resolve each and every issue, whichever is at this uh, place or uh, out there in our world. Thank you very much for this. Thank you. Mm. Straight over to. That's why we are here. <laughs> Straight to Rad. Rad, please. Yeah, hi. Uh, good, good afternoon. Good morning, still, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Radbad Rijn. Uh, most people call me Rad, so you're more than willing to do so. Um, I actually wanted to hear from the Canadians in the panel as well how we deal with symbols of nationalism. If you look at the Netherlands, the symbols of nationalism, our flag uh, and some other ones, are, are, are usually hijacked by the right, the political right. Um, the political left has been shying away from using these, these symbols. I mean, it's fine to be Dutch if you're black or if you have an Asian background, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I was wondering from the Canadian experience how you've been able, or you're probably working on it very hard on a day-to-day -day basis, but to create a really inclusive idea uh, of citizenship and how you can use the symbols of Canada as a, as a tool, as a mechanism to create this. Our most important uh, uh, symbol, our flag, uh, we didn't have a flag until 50 years ago. And, uh, and that is the maple leaf that you now know so well. And it was, uh, it was a determination of the then government under Lester B. Pearson uh, that we have a flag and it was very hotly contested because interestingly enough, you talk about the right uh, being interested in the flag, and no, it's, it's really the left that was interested in the flag. The center to the left was interested in having a flag that basically was Canadian and did not have the Union Jack on it, which is the symbol of, of Great Britain. Um, we, uh, we have, a, uh, a, a, I think, a great attachment now to the flag. At the time, people said, oh, it's badly designed, you know, the borders aren't the right way, and, and, and yeah. But everybody has adopted the flag with great pride, and we are very happy with that. Our other symbol is the beaver, uh, because the beaver is this little furry animal that uh, made the wealth of Canada to begin with, and that's how the native peoples were the ones who showed us the way into the land and made that economic prosperity uh, possible, for we've always had the beaver as a symbol of, uh, of Canada. We also have the maple leaf, which is a mistake, really, because it only grows in the eastern part of Canada, and the birch grows all across the country, and the birch was, was the way in which the native people showed us the way into the country by the fact that they used birch bark to make canoes. And that, that made, the pos made it possible for Europeans, the French initially, and then afterwards the British, to penetrate the country through the waterways. So we should have had the birch, but anyway, we didn't. And um, those are the, the symbols that we know, and of course, maple syrup. 
but uh, but is the we, flag still used by the left as a as no a no so, it's so, not used so. by it's used by everybody okay but, no, but initially it's, initially yeah. it was the center and left that pushed for the flag mm -hmm. and um, and now it is used by everybody and everybody is happy after after a generation and a half that we have the wonderful flag it looks very very good together with 50 other flags or 150 other flags and we are just very happy with it so um, and every every province has its own flag as well. So that's you know that's one of the those symbols I think are are uh, the things that Canada when it goes abroad certainly has that and and I think at home um, we you know we we really think of snow as the basic thing that that unifies us all because we have a lot of it. And, um, and because it just snowed in Toronto, which has one of the warmest climates, you know, snowed three days ago in Toronto. And, um, and it snows and snows until April, May, June in Newfoundland sometimes. So snow is very important to us. And our climate uh, being what people think of as inhospitable, we have for the Institute of Canadian Citizenship a wonderful program which is called building citizenship where we have special ceremonies we ha always have ceremonies when people become citizens in Canada they're held in in offices and so on but we have special ones uh, where we have round tables where new Canadians come and discuss what their life has been like before becoming citizen that day and then we have a party and we show have a cake with the flag on it and that we basically we ha when we have those ceremonies, it's a way, a rite of passage into Canada, and we're saying we're celebrating you because we want you to become, we're happy that you become Canadians. 80% of people who come to Canada as immigrants become Canadians after three to five years, they become citizens. And so that, our citizenship, I would say people probably are, the new Canadians are proudest of their citizenship ceremony and certificate. Adrian, we're, thank, we're down to about 15 minutes. I'm wondering if we might get a couple of more interveners and then allow everybody a, a minute or two to wrap up. I've got another question over here. Great, or comment. Umayya um, Abuhanna. I think that we have these two uh, different extremes. One is about having a family and, uh, and uh, ceremonies and how important it is to have color, but citizenship is about power. Power is never given, it's always taken. <coughs> and uh, if you think about the last elections here in the Netherlands, we don't have a single black MP in our parliament. So instead of blaming the PVV or the far right, take a mirror and look at yourself. We all have a problem in uh, understanding democracy and, and who we are. Instead of, uh, we, we can't think in a void. We have to think, uh, we can't just like blame the whiteness or white men, middle-aged white men. We should change things in structures. We need a change in the structure, for instance, of education. The narratives, I have a 10-year-old daughter who's been to school here in the Netherlands since she was four, so from the first grade. Uh, she's black, she's South African. And I can see that whatever is taught about us as Europeans, about uh, Dutch, she feels excluded. And uh, we can say whatever we want. We don't include the stories of otherness in the story of who we are, wherever we are. That's the main, uh, one of the main problems. So in the case of the Canadians, the Europeans went and stole the land of the native uh, um, Canadians. But in the case of the Nether Netherlands, I had to explain to my daughter. She asked me, who are these Surinamese people? My daughter is South African. I'm Palestinian. And I told, well, I had to explain it very quickly and very shortly. I said, well, People from here went and stole people from Africa, stole land from South America, they put the stolen people in the stolen land, then they stole their children and their work for 250 years, and now we're great. So uh, every time we have a discussion about things like that, and people tell me, uh, why can't we let the past be past? I say, I agree, let's take the whole story, shut down the Rijksmuseum, shut down everything that is where violence of hundreds of years is embedded Huh? So everything you move around, you do, you see where we're standing is part of that long history. And as a, an Arab, I also see every nation, our new immigrants, our new Muslims, whoever, we all have to look at our own violence and colonial history. We're all violent people as communities, all of us. There's not a single community that doesn't have a violent history. But also we have to 
integrate the bigger histories in structures. So instead of having only these discussions and the voting in, uh, during elections, we have to demand things in education from age four, from the beginning. We have to have the stories changed, all of us. And that is what we demand, structure, not only being nice to each other and, and blaming who, whoever or demanding a good family. Ma'am, thank you very much. Maybe time for one more. Back behind you here. Adrian, I think we have time for one more intervention and then, and then we can wrap it up with you. Please. Hi. Um, I'm, I've been very troubled about, by the nostalgia I've seen on stage uh, this morning. I think Sunny Berkman addressed it uh, with, uh, with Mr. Bolu Singh uh, and the previous speaker addressed it too. When we talk about um, the Netherlands as an open society and reference the golden age and then talk about uh, the Mauritz House, both of which are remnants of colonialism, they're symbols of slavery. We cannot talk about those things and then pretend that we have a history as an open society. The same is true for the European Union, which I think uh, Jennifer Welsh did when she talked about the Treaty of Rome as, as an ideal. At the time, France was waging a war to keep Algeria dependent on itself. The Netherlands still had colonies, Belgium was still colonizing the Congo, uh, most of those countries still have colonial relations with their former territories, some uh, current territories, and we have to be honest about the institutional history there and the institutional history of the European Union, of its constituent members, of the racist policies that have constructed our European populations as well. We have continually had racist immigration policies, racist refugee policies, and we cannot pretend that that has not happened, that there is some weird historical period of time when this was all much better. What we are seeing now is a remnant and is a consequence of the way we have constructed our societies. And we have to talk about that and we have to be honest about that and not pretend that it's new or that um, we can go back to the way it was and then it would be better. Thank you. Thank you. Aisha thinks we're gonna, Aisha thinks we're gonna try and get one more quickly and then back to the, to the framers to yeah. close. One quick one very much. Thank you very much. Uh, just a quick question follow up to I think the really important comment that uh, my colleague here uh, talked about. Um, and it, I'd like to ask just from the Canadian experience uh, what the role of schools has been. Schools. Schools. Yes. Because that is really, yes. really important. Yes. It goes back to your point, which is obviously a broader point about power as well. But what has been the role of schools? Uh, and I think um, I think it's critical for that othering process. So we, I'd like to learn a little more about that. Thank One you. of the reasons why Canada has such a successful um, immigrant uh, to citizenship uh, story is that our public education is on the whole very, very good in Canada. That's public education. That is you arrive as a refugee uh, last January, a Syrian family with seven children. Um, and your three little ones, uh, or four little ones, are anywhere from four years old to 11 years old. They immediately went into a public school in the neighborhood in which they were found an apartment by the family that adopted them. Um, and uh, they would go to school, and within three months or four months, they are speaking for English before their parents are ever speaking English. Uh, we have a great history of being able just to take kids in from all different countries. I grew up in Canada right after the war. I had come during the war when nobody knew where Hong Kong was. Uh, being Chinese in Ottawa was like a novelty. There, I didn't see a black person in Ottawa uh, till I would think about 1947. Um, it was such a white bread, white country. And um, I think that one of the interesting things is that it's evolved so quickly. I think one of the things that Canada can teach people is how you can go from a white racist society, basically, which it was, uh, because when I arrived in Canada, there was still barriers against people who were not white to come to Canada and stay there. There was something called the Chinese Exclusion Act, which had been enacted in 1923 to keep specifically Chinese out of Canada. Um, and you had to pay $100 head tax in order to come to Canada, which was a huge amount of money uh, up to 1923. $100 was like you know, $10,000.
and, um, and people paid it even so because they realized if they came to Canada, they could make some money running a little restaurant or running a, running a, a laundry or doing, doing housework for people. Um, anyway, public education is the key to the sex successful integration of immigrants. Children go right into school with others. They learn English immediately. They start, we have a little thing called the Nan Children's, a Syrian Children's Choir, which we've used at, at ceremonies for our institute. They learn to sing on the bus going up to see snow for the first time last January. And, um, and now they sing at all sorts of different events in English, Arabic, and French. And, um, and there is a whole history of the of children just learning what it's like to become Canadian by going to Canadian public schools which are in the area where the schools are. And we have two, two kinds of schooling. We have Catholic and, and uh, Protestant, and, but it's, open, and it's publicly funded by the state, both pub, uh, in Ontario, by, both, uh, by, by the government for both Catholic and, um, and, Pro and, and what we call ordinary public schools. So uh, basically that is the only way in which you can get the proper integration of a, an immigrant population is through public education. That's why we but fight we, very we hard for it. We have public schooling here as well in the Netherlands. Um, um, so I don't know whether that's such a different situation. And, but what is also important to highlight is the, the, the schooling that children get. Yeah. I yes. mean, if it's a completely yes. Eurocentric perspective, yes. I mean, that's something like I'm working at um, at the moment, I'm working at trying, for example, to change the curri curriculum. Right. I, in the last film I made, my own son explained to me what was wrong with the, he's, uh, he's 12, or he was 11 when he pointed it out, that he was, the way he was taught about slavery in school, in the books, was very Eurocentric and was really humanizing the white slave owners <laughs> and was dehumanizing the enslaved Africans. So he, he could see that because we've trained him to look in a critical way. Um, but this is something, and I really want to um, agree with the woman over there, that it is about power. Who has the power to write these stories? Yeah. And I would really like, would be great if this day would continue forward about strategies, how to tackle power, because diversity is about breaking power, and that's the only way, like, because you, you, you can't, like, change an organization by sort of a mere body count and just bring some yeah. uh, black or Arab people in. And, uh, and the, the irony of it is that, um, you had, uh, you had slavery in Canada for 200 years, and yeah. I've never learned about it in yeah. Canadian schools. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we have a great school system, but there's a lot of amnesia and a lot of the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation, Call to Action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, for example, was about teaching about residential schools and what, what indigenous people have gone through as well. So there's, there's a lot that we, more that we could all do to understand our histories so that we can be able to understand the present. A, glo a globalization, uh, as it's also been framed, and I appreciate my uh, relative over there who said, uh, sort of said us, reminded us that globalization has been always built on the idea of uh, geographical, economic, ideological exploitation, violence, and ultimately occupation. And I say occupation because um, when people come, when presence is justified for the purposes of extraction, taking things to place elsewhere in the world. That is occupation. That is not what we're ultimately here to talk about today, which is responsible citizenship. Uh, I think it starts with responsible citizenship and really dedicating yourself to the, to the notion that it is what we bring to the table and that what we even bring to, the, um, the, to those who now feel disenfranchised. And I think the most ironic and odd thing to me is that those in which have those who have benefited the best from exploitation and colonialism and, and and extraction are now feeling oppressed and are justifying their oppression uh, in the Trumpisms of the world as occupiers are now saying I have a right to occupy further and that for me is a real lack of education but it's actually a lack of the nation it's a lack of the nation being able to look at the character of the of what constitutes a citizen and to say that. Uh, the great American dream of the individual life and liberty has been a lie from the beginning. The actual principle of American citizenship has been that indigenous people um, adopted and gifted the opportunity to be a part of a family and a great network of relations. 
that has also been felt across every, every step of every European uh, step, uh, entry, I want to say visit, but entry into uh, nations throughout the world. And that if we turn to those principles of relationship making, they've actually all been there. They're just in a palimpsest. They've been in. They've been over glossed over and ignored in this great march towards neoliberalism. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, I just wanted to say that there are very simple little things that, that can be done in schools, and we do them in Canada very much. So, what about the Christmas trees? No Christmas trees or Christmas trees. Instead of that, we do have Christmas trees, but we also have Diwali, the festival of the lights. We also have Hanukkah, the lighting of the candles. Um, we, we do make a point of telling people that this is, this is all, everybody has their different celebrations and usually having to do with light. And we now have Diwali celebrated at Parliament on, uh, in the capital of Canada. Uh, there's all, there, there's that kind of thing. It looks simple and it looks like, oh, it's, that doesn't matter really. But it does, because when I, I didn't know what Diwali was till, you know, 20 years ago. And, and I should have known when I was little, why wouldn't I? But, but it's brought in because it is important to other people in, your, in, in the group that may not be your friends, you may not even know them. But the point is that we have to make a society of people, not that we all love, because you can't make a society out of the people you only love, that's called friendship or whatever, family, and sometimes in family you don't love everybody, but we have to have a, a, a relationship with other people where you live and they live and you let each other live. That is the meaning of society. It is not about loving them or wanting to be like them. Or any, it is the ability to hold that together as a network of all living human beings. Adrian, you have about two minutes. Do you want to give 30 seconds to any of your... Yeah. Emily's been nodding and smiling and doing things, so I want her to say more. <laughs> um, well, I guess this is, um, well, thank you, thank you for, for having this conversation. Um, the, one thing, the one thing I would say, uh, perhaps as a closing comment, uh, was uh, would to point when the question about symbols, uh, the, the which one that we have, um, re um, recently it was announced that uh, on the $10 bills in Canada, you would now, from now on, have a Vala Desmond, who is known, I'd say, in a nutshell, as Canada's Rosa Parks, although she was before Rosa Parks. Um, it, it's interesting to me because what it means is that we should not only immigrant pe ce celebrate people who make it despite of a system, of the system, but also celebrate people who actively fight Changed. for Changed. making the society better and when we start having these people as national heroes and remember their role in history um, and making them part of the canon of people we celebrate we start thinking differently about the kind of models that we want to have it would be great if we start celebrating and acknowledging the work that these people do uh, earlier than after they're dead because there's <laughs> there's a lot of people who do that kind of work now and that are often painted as, as radical and whatnot and then we celebrate after the fact always and but uh, this is to me the kind of citizenship that I want to see which is people who not, not only make it despite of the odds but work actively at changing the odds uh, and when we start <coughs> celebrating these people uh, we start um, building a kind of citizenship that is about justice and we start defining peace just as Martin Luther King would have said not as an accent of conflicts but as a present of justice and I think this is the way forward, is that as long as we don't have justice and social justice and justice in all its form, really uh, this is what peace in this, in this place should be about. Mm -hmm. Rabin? You know, we are at this time, I think, an eager part of this shock age, and we need to work very hard. And I do agree that, you know, uh, the whole concept uh, of diversity and all that, it is about power. Uh, but not only, you know, education is very important, obviously, but it's not only education. We need to tackle, uh, you know, we need to break walls, um, uh, you know, on several fields. So on the political field, education, of course, the media is very important, I think, because, you know, if you watch television, it's all white, uh, and it's very dominated by the Western concept of, of tackling uh, uh, migration issues and all that because obviously they cannot find, you know, in talk shows uh, people uh, uh, with another migration background than European background to talk about these things. 
So there is work to be done, and of course I did not want to uh, 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 deny that you know, the Netherlands has a colonial past. I mean, <laughs> obviously I am a, a part of that. I am the grandson of uh, 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 an indentured laborer who worked on the sugarcane plantations, uh, uh, the same plantations where, you know, 10 years back slaves do uh, work. He lived uh, in the same houses where slaves worked. The only difference was that he got paid now, uh, and he had a kind of contract. So, so the situation was more or less the same. So I will not deny that. I don't want to deny that. But you know, I want to tackle the question: is why? Because I experienced the Netherlands as a liberal country and yeah, thinking and all that. Uh, and obviously, the 60s of the last century has been very important in that. But how come that only in 50 years' time, you know? things has changed. It's no longer, longer very liberal anymore. I mean, you were talking about Diwali. You will not imagine that, you know, when Diwali comes in, you know, in October and sometimes in November, you know, I get lots of mails. Why do we, why does the prime minister eh, doesn't uh, let the light, uh, etc. It is impossible to talk about these things in, 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 in the Netherlands. I mean, obviously we do something like uh, Idul Fitr eh, for mm -hmm. the Muslims. Uh, in The Hague, but it is impossible to do that uh, with the Prime Minister or at, uh, you know, we also have a small White House, at that White House or even at Parliament. It is not possible because, and indeed, uh, I think we need to decolonize the mind on one aspect, but on the other aspect is we need to show, uh, uh, you know, that, you know, we can adopt and that is not the case right now. So. And that's why I think this uh, debate, uh, this discussion is very important, not only to inspire, but to get some instruments to bring, break that power and to bring people together. And that's what I'm learning every day, and today especially. I would fully, fully agree with you. I'm, um, I'm really an activist at heart, so I'm always looking for ways to uh, bring down the power or, or, or create a revolution. Um, and I have a lot to learn on that front. But I hope a peaceful revolution. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think. But yes, okay, there's another discussion. <laughs> but I do think uh, um, if, we, if we talk about racism and xenophobia, we, what, why people misunderstand a lot of the times they see it as an, an other people problem, but it's a white people's problem and we need to solve that. So, um, and, and, and when you talk about that image of Holland as being a liberal country, uh, Philomona Essid has written about that she says Dutch racism is very specific and specifically um, vile as it were because of that image of uh, being a progressive nation when you have a, a highly inflated self-image that you can't do anything wrong it's very difficult then to talk about what is going on uh, what what is go what is uh, wrong about your nation so that's why it's so violently opposed when an anyone tries to discuss it We'll be interested in hearing you later on. Yes. You're going to be taking part okay. in another thing, which is wonderful. Ne Nigan. Uh, I can hear Charlie reminding us that there's two minutes left, which is the longest two minutes ever. But um, <laughs> just a number of quick things I'll just say. The first is that we don't actually have to find any new solutions. All the solutions have already been figured out for us. Um, we just have to look to the initial, the, the promises of initial relationships. I believe in, I'm like Jennifer on, I'm an eternal optimist in that I do believe in the goodness of humanity and that I, time and time again, humans prove me wrong in the direst of circumstances. I think about Nelson Mandela choosing peace and love over, he could have trashed the country and I was there. Yeah. I was in South Africa at the time. Indigenous peoples today are marching in the streets and not one window has been smashed. Not one car has been flipped. Um, we are going into the institutions because we, for some weird reason, for 150 years later, we still believe in the principle of, of the democracy in which we gifted to Europeans upon arrival. And we still believe in the principle of family making. And so that for me is the, that should give everyone eternal hope in North America, the models of North America. And what I'd say is, uh, for us, it, it lives within our languages, and you yourself have written about our languages, and embedded within our languages is an innate sense of optimism. And I, sp I spoke today, and I, I tricked all of you, 
because I greeted you as my relatives. And what I really said was at the beginning was I said, the people who sound like me, and not because you speak my language or not because you come from my territory, it's because you're speaking the words of peace by your generosity and your gift of being here. For me, that's a gift. The greatest gift you can give is your time. And so I would say gizagin, gizaganak to all of you, because uh, for us, gizagin is the way we say I love you. But it actually, what it really means is you have opened me. You, you have opened me. So our love, I would just take a slight disagreement, which, although I think we agree on this, it's, it is about love. It is about our commitment to love, but it's not the kind of Hollywood romp love that we're talking about. It is the love of responsibility. And it's the responsibility to say that we will only do what we used to do when we would end wars, is we would, we would trade our children, not because we would give them our children away, we would say our children now must do the responsibility of the children that you lost. And our, your children will do the responsibility of the children that we lost. And that's how you make peace. The, um, one of the interesting, I just want to finish in this in that we've, we've trashed colonialism, which is always a thing that happens when we, when we talk together in countries where, where there's, there's white, white people uh, did things to people who were not white and did things to their culture, etc. But Rabin and I are both products of colonialism. colonialism so are you, really. Uh, but we've come, we've come out, of a, out of it into a transformation because things transform. Um, I, I was born in Hong Kong, a Chinese family that initially was diaspora all over the world, including uh, what, was, what is now Suriname, but then was Dutch again. And I said to Rabin when we met that we might be related because my great-great-grandfather was an indentured Chinese laborer in Dutch Guiana. And my the same sugar cane plantation. On the same <laughs> sugar, sugar cane plantation. <laughs> and my family on my mother's side all spoke Dutch. And that's why when they made, when they got out of their indentureship, then they got some money, then they got, yeah, then they came back and they had lost the ties with their village, which is so strong for Chinese. So they went to Hong Kong because they spoke English and Dutch. And my grandfather was a Dutch translator and did things like that in, in Hong Kong, plus English translation. And we were very much formed by the colonial thing. We became Christian four generations ago, which I can honestly say added enormously to my life. Uh, I do not wish that I had been a Buddhist or whatever. I am very, I am what I am now because of what colonialism is, and I accept totally everything that that has been for me. And I think a lot of people don't, can't just say, you know, we should have trashed that, it was a bad thing, and we should have just been left alone, etc. There's very complex interactions like a jigsaw puzzle in, in what colonialism was, what it did for the people uh, who <coughs> exerted the colonialism, and what it did also for the people who lived under it and who interpreted it in different ways in places in the British Empire anyway, like Africa, like India, like the parts of China which they controlled. So all of it is much more complex than just saying, you know, throw off the yoke. We, have, we, we then went to other places which, were, which transformed us and made us different. And I do not think, when I th reflect on my life and my family's life, tough as it was when we came with nothing on a Red Cross boat, uh, with one suitcase each, and we're just thrown into Canada with nothing, nothing, having lost everything. With all of that, I would still say, I am glad I had that life. I'm glad that that happened to me. And I don't think it's being, you know, openly optimistic. I would never have become Governor General of Canada if I'd stayed in China. Well, lovely. Thank you. Same here. <laughs> Emily, Urbine, Sunny, Nigan, Jennifer, who had to catch a flight, I think, on behalf yes. of Adrian, thank you for that wonderful first 360. That was a great start to the day. Very appreciative. It's the hardest one to do, the first one. I was very excited by the number of people who wanted to intervene. I'm sorry we couldn't get to you all, but I assure you there will be many more opportunities to speak, to connect, starting in 20 minutes.